evening. It's a pleasure to be with you. I look forward to being here at Agape Latte a great deal. Let me explain what I'm doing this evening. It's going to be a little bit different from the format of previous times when I've spoken here, in that I'm not going to be so much telling you stories about my life, my family, and so forth, but I'm going to instead be looking at something that I'm writing at the moment. I'm trying to write, many of you may know, I think some of you have probably been in courses that have used a book of mine entitled Doing the Truth in Love. Well, uh, several people, including my good friend and colleague Steve Pope, have been after me for some time to do another book of about the same length and the same style, except this time to concentrate on the question of hope. So I started, I, oh, actually I started two years ago, jotting down things that I thought about hope, jotting down observations that I made, jotting down references to books or articles on, that deal with hope. And then this past summer I started trying to sort those through and put them together and see what it looked like. And uh, so what I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to take one or two themes that have emerged from that process of trying to write the book on hope that uh, will get us into the heart, or at least get me into the heart of what I think hope is about. The second thing I'm going to do this evening is after we've tried to sort out a couple of themes is to then make some observations about how that may be important for us in our time and especially for you in your time because my time is getting further and further away from your time all the time. <laughs> it's um, one of the things that you discover about hope is that it doesn't always sit well with age and you've got to think about how you're going to, at least I have to think about how I'm going to work that out. I'll say a word about that too. First of all, a word about hope. You know that there are all, uh, three theological virtues traditionally. Three theological virtues meaning virtues that are given to us by God. They're not something that we create, that we carve out for ourselves. They're gifts, and those three gifts are faith, hope, and love. Now, there's a lot that could be said about the, their relationship, but the thing I want to center on is something that may seem very simple, indeed almost simplistic, and that is, why are they always in that order? Why are they always listed as faith, hope, and love? Why not hope, faith, and love, or love, hope, and faith? Why is it always that order? I don't think it's simply um, something that we've gotten used to and therefore say automatically. Maybe that's true, but I don't think that's the real reason. I think the reason is because there's a, a mediating role in hope. Hope is something that hooks together our faith and our capacity for love. And unless you see how they're hooked together, you miss altogether why they are important in the Christian life. So first of all, let me say a word about how, they, how hope ties other things together. The all-important thing to notice about hope, and this is something I spend a lot of time, or I will spend a lot of time on as the book gets written, is to emphasize that hope has nothing to do with optimism. Hope has nothing to do with keeping, a, keeping your chin up and always looking on the bright side and trusting that everything will turn out all right in the end. Maybe it will turn out all right in the end. More often than not, it turns out perfectly dreadful in the end. <laughs> but uh, the, the, course, the point is that they aren't in any way connected to one another. Hope is something quite different from optimism. Optimism is the, is the constant and insistent in, uh, uh, position that everything is going to work out all right. And that means everything is going to work out the way I'd like it to work out, the way it would be most comfortable for me to work out. That has nothing to do with hope. Hope confronts a world in which we recognize there may not be a turn for the good. It may, it may not be something that is going to work out exactly the way we hoped. It may be something that's going to be terribly painful or very, very, um, uh, very frightening or very demanding. That doesn't do away, it surprise us as people who live in hope because hope is above everything else a conviction that the first virtue, faith, and the third virtue, love, are in fact gifts. 
They're not something that we achieve. They're given to us. That's why we have to hope for them. We wouldn't have to hope for them if they were something that we could go out and earn or build or dig up or put together in some way. The reason that we, uh, we are able to talk about hope at all is because it's a present. It's a gift. It's a gift from whom? It's a gift from God who gives God's self to us in such a way that we are always, in the re we're always recipients of God's gift. There's no time at which we are the people who, um, who can demand from God or can, can expect from God that God will give us uh, what we hope for. In fact, it's not a matter of God giving us anything. It's not a matter of our taking anything. It's a matter of God's giving something to us. And what God gives us is the recognition that faith, what we believe, what we see in the world, what we see as central to our lives, how we understand ourselves, that that faith and love, the capacity to give oneself away to others, how they're held together by a hope which says, and don't worry, you can't run out of love. You can't deny your faith because they are gifts to you. They're the work of God, not our work. There is a way to deny that. You know, there are two standard um, sins against hope that would normally be spoken of in the catechism. When I, when I was growing up and the catechism, we, we studied catechism in... Uh, all through grammar school, you know, and and uh, you used to go back over the same material every year. I have a thesis. I'll just pass this on to you. This is something you can keep in mind and write a doctoral dissertation on someday. Um, I have uh, I've long suspected that the reason why the Catholic population at large, your parents and your grandparents' generation of Catholics, why they um, heard the faith in, su in such a way that certain things were very important and other things seemed less important. For example, if I said to your parents or grandparents, certainly your grandparents who would have grown up with the Baltimore Catechism, if I had asked them a question like, um, why did God make you? They would, without missing a beat, I would be willing to bet, reply, God made me to love him, to serve him, to be happy with him in, forever in heaven. That was the answer to the Baltimore Catechism, and we studied that every year. We went through the Catechism again. By contrast, if I asked you the question, what is the definition of mental prayer? You wouldn't find that from the Catechism. The reason being is that that was in one of the last chapters. And you see, what happened was every year in September, we started studying the Catechism over again with chapter one which meant that if in the course of your grammar school educations or in the course of your religious education programs, you would have gone through these, uh, these ways of talking about faith and about hope. You would have gone through all of the things we say in the Baltimore Catechism every year starting from the beginning. But frequently, you didn't finish the book. You got caught up with other things in the course of a year. The course fell behind the class schedule. And you graduated without having, or left that class, that grade, without having read the end of the catechism. So that, uh, this is my thesis now, that every, every Catholic who was educated in the United States will always remember those issues that are connected with the first chapters of the book of, of the catechism that will remember them better than they remember the end of the catechism. The end of the catechism we tend to forget, but the beginning of the catechism we remember because we studied it year after year after year after year. And what is it that we, when we studied the, the catechism, what did we say about hope? We said that there were two great, uh, ver two great vices, two great evils that beset us that could lead us astray in hope. One was... Um, presumption, and the other was despair. Presumption was when you thought that all the work that went on in your life, everything you do with your life, all of your love and service of others and their love and service of you, that all of that is something that you do. 
You designed it. You owned it. You've made it up. You've chosen it. You're the one who does it. It's something that is presumption because you presume that you're in charge, not God. The other, which is the one that I wish to spend the most, more time on when I write my book, is despair. Despair is not just a, a kind of fashionable regret. It's not simply um, somebody being disappointed. It's something that is profoundly vicious. And I'll give you an example, if I may. Some of you have heard me talk about this before because I talk about it often in class. It will show up at least once during a, most of my courses. The question of the origin of evil. And I'm going to, uh, the person I always turn to for this, because I think that he is the wisest person I've ever read on this, is the great German poet Johann Wolfgang Goethe. Goethe wrote a book, wrote a play, took up most of his life. He wrote lots and lots of things. But there was one work that he went back to over and over and over again. Every couple of years, he'd take it out, work on it for a little while, write some more, edit it a bit, and then put it away again for maybe another five years. And then he'd take it out and work on it again. And that work, which I'm happy to say he did finish before he died, uh, that work was a verse play, a play in poetry, entitled Faust. And we all know the Faust legend, the man who sells his soul to the devil in order to be given something that the, he knows, that the devil knows he wants, whether it's youth or a renewed lifespan, tremendous wealth, power, the woman he loves. But whatever it is, he sells his soul to the devil, Mephistopheles, his own personal demon, in order to get this thing. And in Goethe's play, in the scene in which Faust first summons up the devil, Mephistopheles appears to him, and Faust asks, says to him, who are you? And the devil gives two answers. They're both brilliant, but the first answer is deliberately cryptic. It's, you really have to go all the way through the play at least once and then go back and start it again in order to get what's going on in this answer. The demon says, I am a part of that power that forever wills evil and forever does good. And the devil says to him, that's a, that's a riddle. I don't want riddles. Tell me plainly who you are. And the demon replies to that, and if you pardon me, I'm going to go into German for a moment because it's so good in German. <laughs> the, de the demon says, Ich bin der Geist der States verneint und das mit Recht, denn alles, was in State ist, wer das es zugrunde geht. Drum besser wär's, dass nichts entstünde. What that means is, I am the spirit that says no, and correctly so, for all things that exist come to an end. Better there should never have been anything. That, I suggest to you, is the heart of darkness. That's real, that's, that's true evil. You see, you don't, here we are, we're, all good people crowded together in a brightly lit room on a pleasant evening, you're not going to, that, that answer isn't going to hunt, haunt you. But some night when you can't sleep, sit on the edge of your bed and don't turn on the light and think about Mephistopheles' second answer, and it'll scare you into the shrieking willies. <laughs> because what, what the demon is saying is that all things that are come to an end. Everything is finite. It, literally, it comes to an end. It falls apart in German, Zugrundegate. It goes to ground. It collapses. It's, it's a creature. And as creatures are simply no good. The only thing that exists that is really good is that which exists absolutely. And that is, of course, God. So God is good. Everything else is junk. If you're God, hold on to your divinity. You're not going to share it with anybody else. You're not going to invite others into your, your, the, the experience of your own divine life and divine love. You're not going to, be, you're not going to do that. You're going to, you're going to hold on to it selfishly and not let anyone else diminish it. You're not going to let it decrease. 
you're going to hold on to it because it's good and everything else is junk. That's the heart of darkness. That's the heart of despair. Have you ever experienced that? Well, I can honestly say, no, I haven't. I've, never ex I've experienced lots of disappointments. I've experienced things that have worried me or puzzled me or things that I've regretted. But nothing that I could say has ever led me to the point of saying, if I'm not everything, I'm nothing. If I'm not God, I don't deserve to exist. Which is what Mephistopheles is, in fact, saying. That's the, the despair that confronts us. Do you see that despair any place in our world at the present time? Yes, I think you see it all the time. You bump into it. We bump into it whenever we're dealing with somebody who is terribly, uh, con terribly concerned with control, control of her life or his life, control of what they're going to do with their lives, and are terribly disappointed if they don't fulfill their own job description. So for example, take, um, take the, uh, the uh, question of making decisions about what you're going to do with your life. Uh, you know that um, some years ago I gave a talk here at BC, and that talk has begun to haunt me ever since. It was the talk in which I first suggested that the ways in which you discern what your role in life is going to be, what your vocation is, depends on three questions. Are you any good at it? I'm sorry, do you love doing it? Are you any good at it? Does anybody need you to do it? Well, that, that has become, it's shown around all over the place now, I gather, on campus. And people talk about it in various classes. And I'm very honored by that fact. But I think it's important to notice that those are questions we ask, not things that we set out to do. We don't set out to create a world in which I fulfill a role, which is something that makes me happy or gives me a sense of, uh, of fulfillment or even can help others. It's not something we set out to do. It's something that we discover we're called to. Well, this, that's exactly what Mephistopheles doesn't want. He doesn't want to be called by God to, to uh, affirm his own goodness, the goodness of his being, the rightness of his existence. He wants to say that it's wrong that he exists. The only thing that's right that should exist is that which is totally complete and perfect in itself, that which is divine, that which is the presence of God. So what I'm suggesting to you is that you must not approach your own future with despair or with presumption. You mustn't begin by saying, this is what I really want to do with my life, but I know I'm never going to be able to get to that. And so I spend the rest of my life resenting the people who do get to do that and resenting myself for not being able to do it. Or I end up thinking I've done it and nobody else can do it any better than I can. In either case, you're just at the point of hope, which is that it's about gifts. It's about God giving us the power to do what we want to do, to do what we love. And you notice, it's, I emphasize particularly, it's to do what we want to do. I'm not saying you have to do God's will, not your own, as if God's will and your will are two entirely different things. They're not. Your ability to will anything is already a part of God's activity in our world. So it's, uh, it's entirely in accord with, you want to know what God wants from you? God wants from you what you want from you. It's just that God wants it even more than you do. That God wants you to be everything that you can be, everything he's gifted you to be, everything that he's invited you to be. If that's the origin of hope, if that's what hope is, then we have to ask another question about it. And that is, where do we find it manifested? Well, I'll tell you where I think I find it manifested. I find it manifested in marriages. I find it manifested, now, you see, this is important for me to talk about because I'm not married, you may have noticed. <laughs> um, the idea that marriage is something that is 
simply a state alongside other states of life, and you, could have, you can live it or choose it or not, is to miss the point of, of, the, uh, of uh, marriage. Marriage is a gift. It's a way in which two people give themselves to one another. And because of that, it's rooted in hope. Remember, hope is what holds faith and love together. That hope, faith is, uh, that hope rather, is something that we have to come with, uh, bring with us to a marriage. We all start out in marriage hoping that this will be proved to be fruitful and rich and wonderful and loving and creative for the couple that are getting married. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's something that we approach with hope always because we recognize that it is, as I've been saying, a gift. And as a gift, we cherish it, but we don't presume it and we don't blame anyone if we don't get it. That we, what we do is we offer ourselves the way in which we can offer ourselves. I'm thinking about something else now for talking about hope that I wasn't going to talk about, but I think I will, and that is you undoubtedly are watching this arm shake like this at the moment. That's because there's something wrong, something wrong in a connection somewhere up here in my brain. You might have said to yourself, oh yes, we've long suspected that, Heinz. <laughs> um, there, there's something wrong in a connection somewhere, and I, I'm a, at the end of my dosage, I have to take a new dose of, of pills, and then it will gradually subside. I remember when this started. Let me tell you the story of how it started. It started because I was at the dentist. I went to the dentist and I had a cracked tooth. It was a, a filling that went back to when I was a boy until it was a very old filling. It cracked now and so the dentist said to me, you really need to get it to root canal and cap that tooth. So I went to the oral surgeon and he had me, it was, the tooth was on the upper left side, upper right side, rather. And he had me down in the, the chair and with my head all the way back so that my head was lower than any other part of my body. And in the course of his working on the tooth, all of a sudden, just like flicking a light switch, this arm started shaking. And... Um, he got very upset, I remember. The dentist was scared to death. It's very nice to go to a dentist where you have the upper hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, subsequently, I went to several doctors and several uh, neurologists, and I was, uh, they kept saying, they'd take one look at it and say, oh, it's Parkinson's disease. And then I'd go on to explain how it had started. It's just like flicking a light switch. It was fine, and then all of a sudden, click, it was shaking. And then they'd say, oh yes, that's rather strange. That's not the way Parkinson's disease usually works. It's Parkinsonisms with, an an with anomalies. Well, that's not absolutely the best way to explain something to someone. You know, I mean, I, I wasn't fond of going to bed at night saying to God, and thank you for giving me Parkinsonisms. With, a, uh, with anomalies. I'm so glad <laughs> that you have. I would have felt terribly disappointed not to have a couple of anomalies in there. <laughs> well, finally, I, went, I found a doctor who is uh, a, a physician who's a very distinguished neurologist and one of the leading experts in the United States on, um, on um, Parkinsonisms. And he looked at it and said, no, it's not Parkinson's disease. It's probably either a very small, uh, a very small stroke or a very small um, aneurysm somewhere in the brain. For the moment, just keep living with it. If it doesn't inc incapacitate you, live with it. Well, I've done that now. This was in November of 1999. So I've been living with it a long time now. What do you do with this? Well, I think what you do with it is you say thank you. I mean, on the whole, having an arm that shakes is better than having an arm that doesn't move because you're dead. I think that it's, um, I think that it's allowed me 
access to understanding how other people feel who are faced was far more serious, far more difficult, far more painful uh, diseases or uh, illnesses. This has given me a much richer sense of what people go through, and I hope that it has made me more compassionate than I was before and that I would be now, were I in perfect health and with my arm not shaking. So that I live in hope that someday this will be okay. And that, but that will be in God's doing, not in mine. It reminds me of a line that I've always loved. It's a very simplistic line. It's not something that I would want to push to the nth degree. But I think on the whole it's a very wise statement and a very beautiful statement. It's what, according to at least some of his biographers, was the last thing that Beethoven said before he died. The story is that Beethoven, whom you know, had been quite totally deaf for at least 25 years before, the, before his death. Great musician, of course. You can imagine what a deprivation it was for somebody with that musical talent not to be able to hear. Well, the story is that on his deathbed, Beethoven said to his friends, I am going to be able to hear in heaven. Well, I like to think that I'm going to be able to stop shaking when I'm in heaven. But it'll be a gift of God's, not an accomplishment of mine. It'll be something one lives in hope of. The last thing I want to say about hope is that it's communal. You see, if I'm going to, if I'm ever going to get rid of this shaking, it's going to be because the whole world has changed, not just because this one place in the world changes. It's not that out of all the creatures that exist, God has chosen to do this for Michael Himes. It's God has willed for all of God's creatures the fullness of their being. And in our interaction with one another, we sometimes foster that fullness of being, sometimes we block it, sometimes we make it more difficult for people around us. Whatever we are doing, it's something that's done in a community. We don't understand hope if we think hope is a purely personal choice or a purely personal experience. It's not. It's an experience that belongs to everyone and we have to be willing to share it with everyone because if we don't we're never going to use, let hope transform our lives and our world as it should. So what I wish for you is that you have your own arm shaking sometime in a way that you didn't expect because that'll help you to grow. And I offer you my deep and abiding good wishes as you think about hope for your future. Don't think of it as your accomplishment Think of it as your gift. Don't think of it as something that God demands from you. Think of it as an enormous present that is given to you. The whole of the universe is your gift. And if at some point in the universe it's shaking a little bit, that doesn't take away its grandeur, its beauty, its wonder, and its capacity for love. Thank you very much.